Yes, Dr. Yeah. Michael. Yes, if you would. Uh, uh, um, good evening, uh, Professor Raed and uh, Professor Malcolm. Uh, you can test your presentations, okay, before we start now? Yeah, C can we uh, make a trial of uh, our presentation, Professor Malcolm and uh, Dr. Raed? Yes, you are yeah, all sure. co-hosts now. Uh, please, uh, Dr. Malcolm, can we make a trial of uh, sharing your screen, sir? I'm doing that only, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, we can see it, sir. Can uh, we, okay. can we uh, stop it, please, sir, and make a trial for Professor uh, Raed? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it takes... yeah it takes me some minute. Okay. Take your time. Take your time. These things are a little tricky. <laughs> Sometimes you and I get stuck. <laughs> Sharing a screen is a headache at times. Yeah. Yeah. It's very easy. Documents, advanced screen. Yeah. You, press, you press on the green button down there, uh, Dr. Rai. Yes, this is uh, yes. something. Yeah. Second, please. Yeah. yeah. Now. Got Mac or iPhone? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, Mac, yeah. Yeah. it's working. You're on. Because sometimes we find some problems with Mac. Yeah, yeah, it's working, sir. Okay. Can we stop it? Sometimes we have some problems with Mac. Yes. So share, stop sharing. Yeah. Hosts and panels. How, how <laughs> sorry, how can I do it? You can find stop sharing. Okay, uh, yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mac, I, I have uh, some friends from uh, UK were uh, sharing their presentations on Mac. They have a, a, a big problem with Mac. Okay, we, we can stop. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. It's a great honor for me to be with us uh, tonight. Two of the eminent guest speakers from India and from Germany. Our dear professor, Professor Malcolm Pestonji from uh, Golden Park Hostel, Vasai, India. Professor Malcolm is one of the big names of spinal endoscopy, not just in India, but all over the world. Uh, and Professor Malcolm will speak about spinal endoscopy. And many thanks for your share with us. This is, a, a, it's a great honor for us here because this is the third time to be with us in uh, our course which is sponsored by the Egyptian Orthopedic Association. Uh, I think Egypt and India have a great history of collaboration. And uh, I made through the Egyptian Orthopedic Association this collaboration more and more uh, eminent and, and obvious. Sir, thank you so much, sir, for joining us. And also to Dr. Raed from uh, Germany. Dr. Raed is uh, my uh, dear friend, uh, my dear brother. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Raed. Thank, Thank you for you. your invitation, Professor Mohammed. You are our professor. Thank you. I use Dr. We will start Raed. our presentation with Professor Malcolm. Please, sir. I think I'll introduce Dr. Raid as the rising star of endoscopy. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. You are the big master, he Professor Malcolm. He's in a trail and he is the future of endoscopy. So it's Thank a pleasure you. to be with us. Let but me sir, start with sir, sir, all, all this gold, sir. <laughs> That's a big master, yeah. I know you, you are the gold, sir. Uh, let me check it. Yeah. Okay, can you see my screen, please? Yes, sir. Okay, now um, let's go into the play format. Yes, sir. Uh, we are going to discuss today, and what I'm discussing today to you is the next evolution. When we come in with a new surgical perspective, there is always that initial rush of blood. You want to see things in a different way. You want to do things in a different way. 
endoscopy opened up a big window in this world. The, the spine can be reached in a very minimally invasive way. Now, whether you do it through one portal or two portals, or you even take a third portal you may need, a sense is that it is minimally invasive. It follows a path of dilatation rather than cutting or stripping of muscles or tearing of muscles. So therefore, two cuts on the skin, one cut on the skin really does not matter. Matter is your ability to give relief to a patient. What matters is your ability to treat a patient. But they say that a surgeon who has no failures is a per surgeon who does not really treat a patient. The more is your volume of work, the more are you going to have your birds coming back to us, to you. It's like a pigeon. You send it with a message, it is going to come back to you. So therefore, spine evolves. And in its evolution, we first start with, let us say, discectomy, then stenosis, then a little fusion. But what comes back to you is the problems that come back to you. Now, problems can be inherent, intrinsic, or they can be iatrogenic. So when we say inherent and intrinsic, you can say it's a recurrence of a pathology. I did a discectomy, patient comes back to me with recurrence. Now recurrence is not because I did a bad job in the first place. Recurrence is because of the nature of the annulus. Annulus doesn't heal. After years, it remains open. And a person can, who has got let us say, a, a badly degenerate disc of, of Firmin's grade 4, grade 5, and patient has got a lot of uh, sclerotic changes in the bone and plates. The highland cartilage is separated out. These are the kind of patients who are going to have recurrence because new fragments are going to detach. And it's like a sinus. The path is still there. So recurrence is natural. So without commenting upon a surgeon and his capabilities, recurrence is something that all spinal surgeons face. Now comes the question of new additional pathology. In redo spine surgeries, you will come across a segment wherein you initially did, let us say, a discectomy. Now patient has come back to you with fibrosis, foraminal stenosis, progressive lysis and listhesis, degenerative listhesis, Degenerative scoliosis, all new additional pathologies developing over a period of time. But the patient has faith in you. You have done his primary surgery. He's going to come back to you. You can't say, you know, I am only the first time surgeon. I will not do a redo surgery. So redo surgeries is going to be the next gen of evolution. And you are going to face your problems. Maybe not in your first, second, third year of endoscopy. But maybe like person like me who has been doing endoscopy for many years. Oh. So obviously my problems are going to come back to me. The third major problem is the failure to achieve the goals that you had set in your prior surgery. Many times we, let us say we're dealing with severe stenosis and it's a global stenosis, the word I will use, wherein there's a large element of foraminal, lateral and central stenosis. Now a surgeon really has at a little upper levels of the lumbar spine where the laminas are a little tightly inclined, large facetal hypertrophy has occurred. He manages to do the central decompression. He manages to do a very nice lateral decompression, but he may not succeed in doing good foraminal decompression. So he has left behind and not achieved a goal that he had planned in his surgery. Whether he does it by open surgery, whether he does it with a microscope or whether he does it with a tubular attractor, easy go system, name it. The surgery is essentially and intricately difficult and therefore he may not achieve his primary goals. And believe me, when I can quote from all meta-analysis that 60% of failure in spine surgery, the root cause lies in the foramen. And Reaching the foramen, whether it is from outside or inside, is a tad bit difficult when you're dealing with open spine surgery or with a microscope. Endoscopy changed that paradigm to a large extent and things did improve. 
So what are my guiding principles? What, what guides me when I want to do a redo spine surgery? I must land somewhere where there is normal anatomy. So if there's a little bit of lamina left, I want to land on it. If there's a little bit of facet left, I want to land on it. And from there, millimeter by millimeter, I want to directly start my exploration. In open spine surgery, what do we do? We retake the midline cut. We go down to a particular depth. Then we go laterally to hit the facets, retaining the central tissues. And then we try to get in down by the side of the cord. Endoscope is quite similar, except that with an endoscope, I bypass everything and I directly land on the lamina, which is retained, or I directly land on the facet. So I already got my depth. I know now I have to go a few millimeters lower down from here to reach the cord surface. How do I dissect? That is comes in the later part of this topic. The other way around is, ke, okay, now I feel ke, I have to redo this but I don't want to use the same approach. I want to use a different corridor. So I can reach the same point where I reach in the primary surgery by coming through a lateral corridor, doing a para-UV approach or doing a transfer aminal approach. So doing the same surgery, but from a different corridor. So you can reach the same pathology or you can address the newer pathologies that have come up. So these are my guiding principles when I'm dealing with redo spine surgeries. Now, let us take this particular patient over here. This patient, I had done a fusion at 4-5 and patient had a up-migrated disc at L3-4. And patient came back with a massive re-herniation in that period of eight weeks. And patient had delayed re at the upper level. Now what do I do? So I say, okay, let me go back. Let me try and remove this huge migration and re, re that has occurred at the upper levels. So when I re-explore the same corridor, now I'm going through the same corridor, and it's not a new corridor. I try to find the IAP. From the IAP, I try to find the transverse process corner. And then when I go down, I see these fronds of tissue. Now, these fronds, red fronds of tissue, are the synovium. And that white structure below down there is the recurrent disc herniation. So, trying to understand the normal from the abnormal pathology is very important. But despite removing so many fragments, I'm still not able to remove the full thing. So, I climb up. I start burying out the IAP. And then finally, I fracture out the entire IAP. You can see how I'm breaking out the IAP. But I've retained the flavor. Today, I have changed my surgical style and I've brought in a new type of T-lift surgery where I retain the flavor. Now, this is after doing the bone grafting, preparation of the end plates, flavor is intact, the cage has gone in. So I'm now extending my fusion, but I've done it four five. Now I'm extending it to three four. But even after all that, when I sweep under the cord, I still find reherniated fragments. So the only thing that gave me a clue was a non-pulsatility of the cord at that time. There was too much of tightness after the cage had gone in. I was not happy, so I explored. And when I explore, I find further fragments. I remove those fragments and my cord becomes pulsatile. Everything starts pulsating. The exiting root starts pulsating. And I extend the fusion unilaterally on one side. Patient has done subsequently very well. She's gone on to fusion. But this was my own creation, my own problem, and I had to deal with it. So let us go to the next the development of new additional pathologies. Now, this patient had done way back, way back, I think maybe around 2005, 2004. And you can see this classical PLF cages, but you can see that this fusion has occurred over there. And a wide decompressive flavectomy has been done. So the central cord is well expanded. 
Now the patient comes back to me with secondary foraminal stenosis. There is fibrosis around the root and the axilla. And, but in this case, there is no instability. Okay, so the development of new pathologies is listed on one side. And now we are playing the video of the patient over here. And you can see over here that the foramen is completely occluded. Fusion has occurred, so I'm not very much scared. I can, I can sacrifice a little more extra amount of the facet. You can see this whole thing is totally occluded over here. There is a grade three deformation of the root. So I start going down. I separate out the tissues, again, following the old surgical track. Go down by the side of the dura. Go down into the axilla. And going around the axilla, I've entered the root canal. Burning out, freeing up all the tissues over there. And slowly exploring the path of the root that has to go out. And again, you see that as the root comes out, out and I've opened up a little extra, undercut a little extra of the facet, can you see the fat on the root? And you can see how I can introduce my dissector completely nicely outside of used facet. So without creating any additional instability, I could address this pathology from within itself. Because I felt that the fibrosis was quite a lot inside. And I felt that this root needed to be freed more from inside rather than from outside. And patient has already achieved fusion. So therefore, the question of instability was not haunting me. I had already removed the rods. Patient only had retained cages. And now patient, after almost 20 years, has come back for a redo. So it was something unique. It was something that was enjoyable to do. Let us see failure of previous surgery. Now, failure of previous surgery can be implant failure, cage, pedicular screw migrations, ages and this disease developing, and even spondylitis. And this is my own patient. A high level down migrated disc done comes back to me. It's spondylodiscitis, one of my rare cases of discitis. But yes, my own. What do we do? So we decided we must revise this patient, clean out this mess, remove this epidural mass, remove all the abscess, and remove the down migrated, re down migrated herniation. So we do a para UB approach here, and we do a T lift in a para UB approach. So here I'm cutting and breaking away the IAP corner. I'm doing a laminectomy removing everything, now going down by the side of the cord, probing out, changing my scope and instrument to bring it from a different direction and chase down onto the body of the down migrated fragment. To clear it out, I have prepared the disk space below. You can see the disk space is ready below, but I need to remove this fragment which is down. You can see that even in the x-ray over here that I'm on the body. Having cleared out everything, then going back to the prepared end plates, doing a little more of curating, grafting. This is opposite side decompression, going down in the opposite lateral gutter, making sure this time that the decompression is complete, and then putting in a peak cage. Why peak? Because less reaction, making it horizontal, and then progressing to fusion in this particular case. Patient pathology, the by organism was identified and we could treat her very nicely, comfortably, a pain disappeared. She did pretty well. So this was like a creation of a new pathology with the recurrence of a pathology. Not a very happy situation, but ended well for patient and for me. Now, let us take this particular case. See this patient's X-ray. You'll see that at L5S1, there is a huge fusion mass. This is not my patient. This patient came to me. She had undergone a wide laminectomy 10 years back, guys. And you can see the wide laminectomy, but you can see the fusion in front also. Now she develops severe sciatic pain and numbness in the leg for the last two years. So I'm wondering, okay, with a wide laminectomy done, fusion over there, there is no actual pain. Why this sciatica? Where does sciatica come from? There must be some source of it. So I'm asking you guys to help me. So look at this x-ray carefully. And let us look at the next slide. 
uh, oh no, yeah, let's start playing this thing. It's a playing a presentation, so let me pause it here. And you can see here that the foramen is quite open. The roots look normal. The fusion has occurred over here. There is no real major hump. There is no real major pseudo disc. Why is this patient in so much of sciatic pain? I mean, what is the cause? There has to be some reason. So I say, let's get an MRI done. Now, MRI done over here. See this image here, the arrow is moving, and you can see that the left root is free. Pain is in the left lower limb. But I see something which is troubling me here. And the thing that is troubling me is I feel that there is a band over here. Calcific band coming here. This is not normal. There is something there that needs to be looked at. So we go one step further. You say, let's do a CT scan also. And I'll pause this once again. And you can see here in CT scan, the foramen is quite open. Here the foramen is open. Foramen is open. There is nothing in the canal. There's nothing in the foraminal canal. Whatever is there is outside the foramen. It's a classical Wiltsay's extra foraminal entrapment of a nerve root. You can see the CT scan from front. You can see it from behind. It's fused. As a matter of fact, the laminectomy is massive. Now when I land on the sacral ala and I'm climbing up onto the S1 pedicle, I see a huge extra foraminal ligament. This is known as a corporal transverse ligament. It's part of the iliolumbar complex. And you can see that it's white and it's calcified. I cut through it. I see a lot of fibrosis there. I can see the dura there. And the axilla has come and got stuck to the S1 pedicle because of the collapse in a lysthetic position. So I tear out all this fibrosis slowly and surely. And finally, I peel away from the pedicle. I peel away from the pedicle, the root. And you can see below there's a hard calcified disc over there. So that disc is not troubling the root. It was fibrosis. And it was an extra foraminal calcification and thickening of the coracotransverse component of the iliolumbar ligament. Now, if I had not gone from outside, landed on the sacral lela, climbed up onto the S1 pedicle, I would not have visualized this pathology at all. I would have missed it. And patient was crying in pain. Bad sciatica. So sometimes you need gentlemen to do out of the box thinking. Everything is not served to you on a plat. And that's why I said that foraminal pathologies, we tend to disregard them, we tend to dishonor them but they are one of the major reasons for our failed back syndromes that come and hit us back again. Let us go to the next thing. It should have been laws of attraction, but I made it into laws of cage extraction. <laughs> so what do you do? You see this patient's below, you see the x-ray. It's an old case of mine. She's actually progressed to fusion and she's come back with a huge cage extraction. I mean, cage has come back into the canal. What do I do? So, what do I do is first I identify and land on a normal tissue. I have to create a safe delivery corridor for this cage. This cage has to come out. But this cage is not going to come out easily because all these cages have a central hole. So, when we have cages with central holes, there is bound to be fibrous tissue or bone spicules within these central holes. And now you pull this cage out and this fibrosis is adherent to the dura or to the exiting root, you have a major axillary injury over there. So you just can't pull a cage out blindly. Therefore, the traversing and exiting roots must be visualized. Extraction at all stages of removal of the cage must be a visualized affair. As a matter of fact, putting in a cage should be a visualized affair. Removing it should also be a visualized affair. But then let us put it down in the form of laws. So let's play this video and just let's enjoy what happened and what I had to do. So since I can see, I can just pause this here. One second. 
I pause this video and you can see there is a fusion mass developing right in front. It's about eight months post surgery. She is on teriparatide. She is progressing towards fusion, but she has exploded and explosively put out the cage. I don't know what she did and I don't know how it happened. Implantation is good. Everything is good, but the cage came out. Fine. Fair enough. We accept what happened. Let's not go more details into why it happened. Let's go into details of how to deal with what happened. So here, yeah. again, I'll pause it. You can see that there is ossification occurring over here in the bone mass that is put in front, but the cage has come back out. That's not good. Now, what have I done? I have targeted, again, I've paused and I've targeted here. I can show you I've targeted a very fine bit of lamina, which was left behind after I put in my cage. So, let us see what to do. So we triangulate on that lamina, start opening up from there, and finally, gradually finding the facetal edge, go down, identify the cage, clean up the cage using very nice three different types of probes, and finally we start removing the rest of that lamina. I must identify the dura. I must go around there by the side of the cage and identify the exiting root. So whatever I can cut, I can cut and remove. You can see the fibrosis over there. We're peeling it off. What you can't. And by now there's no space left. So what I do is I osteotomize and I break away that remaining part of the eye. I must, even if I need to enter a little bit of the pedicle to cut it, I will still do it. And after I remove everything, you can see the fibrous tissue that was in between. You could see the root. And at the end of delivery of that thing, the root is intact over there and a pulsating dura over there. There are fibrous tags on the root. Let's not bother to remove all of them because we can damage the root. She did well. We didn't need to do anything more. Fusion is already set in. Most of the bone graft was in front of the cage. So let it ossify. The rods and screws are in place. So I don't expect any further collapse to happen. And I pray that she has a beautiful recovery. This was done by me a few months back. So we will get her follow-up someday. Let us go to the next thing. Now see this patient. This was one of my early, maybe 10, 12 years back. I done a transcambin facet sparing fusion using a transforaminal endoscope or what you call as a monopotal, a full endoscope. The cage has been introduced from the left side. Patient is having pain now on the right side, partially because maybe of subsidence of cage. So therefore the foramens get compressed. Now, posterior midline corridor is completely intact. I have put in a cage to the foramen. I've spared both the facets, but subsidence has occurred. Secondary foraminal stenosis set in. Some amount of central stenosis has set in. So I say, okay, fine. We have a virgin corridor. That is the main central corridor. We have never gone through the back, in the center of the back. Why not we do something there? So we decide, okay, fusion has already occurred. Let us go ahead and remove the implant first. Then do the decompression. So you can see over here the severe foraminal stenosis. I start by identifying my locations and removing the screw. So first comes out the ENI, obviously. So you can endoscopically, what you can put in, you can endoscopically remove. That is the first rule of life. Grabbed the rod and pushed it, pulled it and pushed it out through the same old original scar. But now, See the rod coming out of the skin. But this is the opposite side, correct? We had put in the cage from the left. Now we are working on the right. And you can see here the upper edge of the lower lamina. And you can see the upper edge of the facet itself. You can see how tight it was. So we did a lot of burring, opening up. And then we did an end block flavectomy. You now all this stupid butterfly challenge thing goes on. I advise my students never to fall for that trap. You can have a lot of dural tears. 
try to justify it, but I don't agree with it. And that's a personal opinion. Now going down into the opposite lateral gutter, into the opposite foramen, removing a little bit of tissue from there, decompressing, keeping some foramen flavum intact over there, and then doing a ipsilateral undercutting to free up the entire exiting nerve root. So at the end of this video, what you see is the exiting nerve root, the axilla, cut ipsilaterally, undercut on the same side. You see a lot of fibrosis over there. This was the reason why she had a lot of pain. So central stenosis, lateral recess stenosis, and secondary foraminal stenosis all developed in this patient because of only one thing, subsidence of a cage in an osteoporotic lady despite the fixation happened and it had to be dealt with. This is how I dealt with it. You will have your own methods of dealing it with, but this is the way I did it. Here you have a patient. Now this is again not my patient, but this patient was a very unique case. Somebody had done a fusion for him. Not really put in a cage or even a bone graft. Just a discectomy and a fixation. Somehow that thing collapsed and he went into a good fusion. But despite the fusion, you can see over here in the foramen here, the root is not cleanly visualized. There is a little bit of um, bright tissue over there, vascularized tissue. That's not a normally normal looking foramen for me. So I take a new path. This time I take a para UD path. And we start exploring this foramen. And you can see how I've come in a very extreme lateral para UB approach, gone underneath the metallurgy. And there you can see after so many years, you can see all this muck lying down by the side of the root. Discal fragments, bone graft, calcium deposition of multiple root blocks. And finally, I go around the root. Now I'm caudal to the root. I'm in the axilla. I'm removing the recurrent little or retained recurrent herniation that was there, entering into the disc. But I see a band across the root. I tear that band. Now when I tear that band, I see there's a lot of vascularity in that band. Despite the fact that we are using fluid and there is fluid pressure that still looks red, not very healthy. All this is not very healthy. So I'm using an arthroscopic fine punch. I was one of the first persons in the world to use this arthroscopic punch in spine surgeries. But it helps me to work in very tight corners. And you can finally see the flavum and the axillary corner and everything cleaned out over there. We put in a lot of fat which we removed from just below the skin, packed it around the root. And fortunately, the patient did well and I have had a less of a headache after that. I'm coming to this presentation and you can see over here a recurrent disc herniation here. Old UB corridor over here, slight wet facets, recurrent bulging disc. But if you see this foramen over here, you will see the foramen very tight. You will see a tip of SAP come up. Black tissue over here. Small amount, maybe a cyst over here coming from this facet joint and flavor. And you can hardly see the root. And there's a foraminal a component to this disc. This disc, foraminal component. Not a very good and a healthy situation. What should you do? You have to do a redo. You can even see the old approach path. Not retain multifidus here on this side also. Not much of muscle wasting. And you can see here I've triangulated in the subpedicular region. And I'm trying to now. Let's start this. Yeah. You can see I've triangulated. I'm stripping the tissues up and down on the physical edge because previously I've done a UB surgery for a discectomy. And now patient has come back with a recurrence. So I'm going down in a para-UB approach. You can see the SAP. You can see that I've opened up the facet joint. 
And you can see this fluffy tissue here, vascularized fluffy tissue. That is the SAP corner. This is the SAP transverse process corner. I had done undercutting and exploration of this foramen from within. That time it was nice because there was a herniation. I removed the herniation, but now collapse has occurred. You can see some of the retained flavum also over there. But I'm now cutting this superior pedicular corner. I must get onto the exiting root. I must get above the exiting root. I must be flush to the superior pedicle. This is the kind of fluffy tissue that you will see from the facet capsule that you have left behind in your previous surgery. This was on the outer side of the facet. Obviously, I couldn't reach it. But see how it has grown, how it has become vascularized, and see how it is causing irritation to the nerve root. So sometimes when we blindly undercut into the foramen and we say, okay, I decompress the foramen, this is what you leave behind. This is the problem that you face subsequently. So you see how the vascular tissue is coming out, how all this muck is being cleared up by me. Now this patient has come back to me with secondary foraminal stenosis and collapse and I have to go in a para-UB approach. I'm trying to cut flush to the transverse process superior pedicular corner. I'm getting to the top of the root. The root is vascularized. You can even see a vein here. This is the vein accompanying the traversing root. This is the vein accompanying the exiting root. Now these veins are new anatomical landmarks. They're in a different uh, session of mine, infusion session, but I follow these landmarks. I'm cutting the vertical part of the superior articular process and fracturing the inner hidden part. So both break now. After removing them, I'm going down onto the floor of the disc. One side is the root. One side is the traversing root. So the traversing root is not being seen cleanly. There is a lot of fibrosis there. This whole muck is fibrosed. And this is the reason why rather than have pain in the L4 root, patient is having more pain in the L5 nerve root. So I start stripping it. And as I strip it, you can see how white, tight this nerve root is. Now the tightness comes from two things. One is fibrosis, the PLL, which is adherent to it. So I'm cutting away the PLL below the nerve root. And I will now be entering into the disc after I do this. And here comes out the retained fragments, the recurrence of the herniation, huge fragments, a lot of them came out and I can show you an endless video so I'm curtailing that part of it but eventually I'm sweeping with a hook I'm sweeping with a hook, I want to separate the PLL from the dural sleeve and I want to tear away all that fibrosis clear it out, see the undersurface of the dura, see the surface of the PLL Make sure there is nothing adherent over there. See that the traversing root, which is exiting below, the L5 nerve root is completely freed. My axilla is freed. The herniation is out. A few tags remain on the exiting root. Let them remain. Try never to remove everything cleanly. Part of the SAP is cut. That is the discal surface below for you. So this was a redo surgery with a new corridor three years post-primary discectomy. Why? Because secondary foraminal stenosis set in. So gentlemen, we need to understand that every time fusion is not the answer. Sometimes endoscopy gives you a better perspective. So let us have a take-home message after all this. One must identify the exact pathology. So use x-rays, use CT, use MRI. They will guide you. They'll show you a better picture. Try and be least traumatic as possible. Friability in tissue identification, knowing what is a remnant uh, facetal capsule, what is the root, where it lies the disc. This tissue identification will be an issue in your initial few cases when you are doing your redos, but eventually you will master that. You must decide between a new corridor or revisiting the same corridor. Or using both. 
like I did a para UP, I was not happy. So I went up and I, from inside out, I did an extra flavor T leaf and merged both the corridors, put in a cage, put in the graft, finally did the flavectomy after the decompression on the opposite side. So you can do a lot with endoscopy. You must decide between a new corridor or revisiting the same corridor, like in the case where I showed you of an old PLIF that came to me, where I decided, okay, no, let me do both. It is better I do both. So you must decide what you need to do. Find burring of bone by a millimeter rather than using a dissector is a far safer way because it causes auto separation of the neural elements which are plastered to the bone. As you burr away at that part and slowly burr away and push, you will realize that the neural tube just moves away from you. Believe me, I had zero incidences of dural tears in the redo surgery work that I have done. I know it's not a lot and I should not standardize on that. But compared to open surgery where we have almost about 20 to 30% incidence of dural tears and suturing of dural tears, endoscopy, I feel, is much better. So I have used this word, literally I've used this sentence, that dural tears in endoscopy or redo surgery is a myth. As a matter of fact, I'm more comfortable. Post-operative antifibrosis protocol using TNF beta blockers, one of the drugs that is now available post-COVID is Pirfinab. After four to five weeks of surgery, if the CRP, PCT, all that comes to normal, and I'm really confident, leaving aside spondylodiscitis, please let's not get there. Leaving aside everything of infection, if everything is normal, I would definitely use a two to three weeks steroid protocol, low-dose steroids, perifinabs, and many other drugs have come in uh, from the EMAP group, which are antifibrotic which suppress TNF beta and you can pack in a little of fat over there around your nerve roots. So you have various options to try and prevent refibrosis from occurring. I think I shall stop sharing my screen now. My mouth has run dry I continue to talk. I hope you have enjoyed this little talk of mine. Thank you so much, Professor Malcolm, for this very interesting presentation and for sharing, uh, sir, your long experience with us. It was an honor, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. You, thank you, sir. Great. Thank you. This Dr. is very uh, good. Uh, will be the moderator uh, for questions with you, sir. He's one of your, uh, your, your new generations and students, of course. Yeah, of course. We, we are so glad to have you tonight, Professor Malcolm. You have a great talk about uh, the role of endoscopic surgery in revision. I, it's a big uh, evidence uh, that endoscopic spine surgery is not only for simple discectomy, but it uh, has its own speciality and we can do all tasks with it. Definitely. I, I, I think the next generation of evolution is what now I'm going to be working upon is in uh, deformity surgeries. That is the next step, whether we can do pointes, we can do other uh, osteotomies, and we can do minimally invasive corrections there. So getting out of the degenerative segment, infective segment, uh, more into the tumor segment. Unfortunately, I'm not a neurosurgeon, so therefore I don't go into the intradural segment. But my neurosurgical friends have already started doing UB and even monoportal intradural surgical work. So therefore, endoscopy is a big tree. It's vast. It will grow and will grow on the shoulders of young people like Dr. Raiden. That is our future. God bless you. God bless you. Uh, thanks, Professor Malcolm. Um, I'd like to ask of the, uh, our colleagues uh, of Zeha, if someone have any question for Professor Malcolm. Uh, he can he can raise his hands. People are most smart. The, the rule of uh, endoscopic spine surgery in deformity, deformity surgery. Uh, I believe it's a matter of um, operation time when 
the when we as a surgeon start to have endoscopic spine surgery as as routine standard surgery so we are um with with the compression surgeries we are when we are fast or more faster with the compression surgeries we do more multiple levels and when we do more multiple levels so we can do more facetectomies and more osteotomy and then you, you, we can do a uh, long segment fusion or the mere segment fusion we, we and the, from anterior operation from anterior combined with endoscopic uh the compression on the osteotomy is minimal invasive for the endoscopic it it's 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 a real great uh, great uh, advantage for patients and for us i'll just tell you this much right when i started and when i first did my real first tight stenotic decompression it took me almost two and a half hours one level today in two and a half hours i normally do about four to five levels so that time change has come instrument handling the ability to understand things have changed and it evolution see what happens is that you know people i come across a lot of people and people set standards i mean i usually hear this argument oh with a tubular i can do a t-lift surgery in one hour and i can go home and you endoscopic guys take three hours fine but we developing we are being born today the way we prepare an end plate, you guys just can't prepare it because you can't go inside and even see the end plate. I can see the end plate from corner to corner. I don't like what I see by just using rotary shavers. I need to prepare it better. So I'm going to take a little extra time. Now, is time the only judgment of a surgery? Is it the only parameter by which we are to, supposed to judge ourselves? I think that's unfair. And over a period of time, we are also coming up to that standards where we are also finishing our um, four screws and two rods and one cage in less than one and a half hours. It's, it's just a matter of time. It's a matter of evolution. It's a matter of practice. It's a matter of judgment. Tell me one T-leaf surgeon who sees a route from an axilla to its entry into the psoas outside the SAP. Most of the surgeons who do T-leafs today, they are doing uh, P lift, T lift kind of surgeries. They don't even completely cut the superior articular process. They just make space to put in a cage. This is one thing I'm totally against. What happens when a root is fibrotic and it is stuck to the discal surface on the outside or at the SAP tip or outside the SAP and you can't see it? And then you use a huge cage for distraction. Patient wakes up with a foot drop. Why? Because you never bothered to see what you should be seeing. And you can't see that, not with a tube, unless you keep changing the position of a tube. Because a tube will not allow you to see from midline to outside. Because the distance is too large. The distance is almost more than 2 centimeters. And people have egos. People say, I use only 13 millimeter tube. I use only 11 millimeter tube. So fine. Then you don't see. And then you don't see. Then you have problems. But I oh. believe that no, I should see a root from its axilla till it's out. And like I told you, in nowadays, the fusions that I do, I don't even remove the flavum. Flavectomy is the last part of the surgery. I, I, I do the same. I do flavectomy at, at, uh, at the end of the surgery. So flavic surgeries. Do all your bone work from outside. See how things have changed. We've changed the paradigm. We've changed our approach. We've changed our performance. So it's it, spine is like apples and oranges and watermelons. And it's a fruit basket, guys. Don't compare one thing with the other. Every technique is special. Every surgeon is special. Even open spine surgeons are special. They are great. We must learn to respect them. And they must learn to respect us. We have to move to a world of consensus, not be opinionated. That is the difference. That is the message, guys. I hope it reaches across the world and we all learn to respect each other better. That would be the fun. Today, I see people fighting between uh, monoportal, full endoscopy, 
and bipotal and transforaminal. Yes. It's a mess. Why? The, this is that. This sorry, this is a big question now in Europe and in the United States about monoportal. What, why is bioportal also important? Why should I, we adopt bioportal techniques? I, I tell you what, I tell open spine surgeons that if you are good at open spine surgery, please stick to it. If you are good at microscope, please do that. If you are good at tubulars, please do that. If you feel the need for change, if you feel the need to do better. If you feel I, I am having a deficiency gap, there is a management terminology known as deficiency gap. Why did I become an endoscopic spine surgeon? I was doing my tubular surgeries with a microscope in 2004. Why did I change to endoscopy? Why did I evolve in endoscopy from transforaminal to full endoscopic to UB? Is because I felt that I saw searching for something better and better and better. But it is for every one individual to decide where he will search and how much more he will search. If you are happy with what you are doing, don't change. There is no need. There is no need to compare yourself with others. And if you feel the need to change, either you change or you take the help of a colleague who can do things for you. So it's time for collaboration. If an open spine surgeon feels, I cannot deal with this foraminal pathology, let him collaborate with us. Let the endoscopic guy move in. Who is the who is who is the God? The God is the patient. Allah asks us and directs us to treat our patients. So let's not fail there. I think we have a question from Ashraf. Yes, Dr. Ashraf, I have uh, allowed you to speak, sir. You are unmuted, sir. Yes, please, sir. Uh, good, good evening. Good evening. Uh, now we are by night uh, at Cairo. Uh, thank you, Doctor Ashab, for allowing me to uh, um, to to um, together with this. Uh, what 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 I am asking about is: uh, Do you have any cases of uh, recurrent fibrosis, periradicular fibrosis? This especially, is, is... especially following the uh, uh, the uh, excision or uh, reinsertion of a uh, of uh, of a cage. And uh, thank you. Yeah, yeah, I I appreciate you. Uh, what I have faced and what two patients have shown you today, one was of cage extraction. And, uh, these were not re-fibrosis post-case extraction. So really, I can't comment on to you on that. But at the time of removing of a cage, and if you feel there is fibrosis there, please follow the antifibrotic protocol. Try and do your best. There is, there is nothing else that one can say because there is no answer here. The answer is yes, TNF-beta blockers, like TNF-alpha, there is TNF-beta. So if you block the TNF betas, maybe you will have less of fibrosis occurring over there because it suppresses the fibroblasts. Use of fat, use of uh, hyaluronic acid, uh, long chain uh, hyaluronic acid. You can use, you know, you have multiple options. You can use steroids for a few days and try and suppress fibrosis. And if you have fibrosis, which you feel, which you're confirmed, then yes, you have to use one of these surgical techniques to go there, strip, remove the fibrosis, make the root free, and then initiate an antifibrotic protocol. And after that, believe me, pray. And just pray that the patient does well. There is really no other answer to that. Because like I tell you, in my own evolution, I have evolved till now. Maybe what question you ask is the next further evolution that I may face of either after reimplantation of a cage or after removal of a cage, if one of my patients were to come back to me, I'd be able to answer you. It's not happened till date. So I have even not even, I have evolved till that stage. So I can't really comment on it. And that's a very honest answer to you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, I, we I think we have uh, no more questions. 
Thank you so much, sir, for, for this uh, interesting presentation. And many Thank thanks you. for your sharing your long experience with us, Professor Malcolm. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank sir. you, Professor Malcolm. Let's start you up, young man. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Good. Now we will move to the next speaker. The next speaker will be Dr. Raida Hussein, Senior Spine Consultant, uh, St. Elizabeth's Hospital, uh, Gottesloe, Germany. And he's a faculty advisor and endoscopic spine survey. Uh, Endoscopic Spine Academy, I'm sorry. Uh, Dr. Raed, thank you so much for being with us. It's it's an honor. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Mohammed. Thank you, our Professor, for your invitation. And thanks, thanks Professor Malcolm, for being with us to, tonight and all, other, our, all our colleagues. Should, should I share my screen? Yes. Full can you see that? Yes, we can see it. Full screen, sir, please. So far, immediately. Okay. Yes. Now sir. can. You... Okay. Yes, sir. We we can see it, sir. Um, at the beginning, I would like to talk uh, to tonight about endoscopic spine surgery, an overview about endoscopic techniques, and how endoscopy is not only for simple discectomy, but it can help us to do all jobs in, in, in spine surgery, or the most of jobs in, in spine surgery. My disclosure, my question is, is endoscopic spine surgery a new specialty? It's like, I think we are now in the, the, in the time, uh, it's like laparoscopic abdominal surgery, or like um, atroscopic shoulder and knee surgery. So I believe, in my opinion, it's a new speciality. And it can, with endoscopic spine surgery, we can do this kick to me from simple to complicated one. And with endoscopic this kick to me, we can sometimes, in complicated cases, uh, avoid fusion. And we can do complicated decompression cases also without iatrogenic instability, so we can avoid fusion. And when it comes to fusion, so endoscopic spine surgery plays a big role for fusion. And in my opinion, my hands and in good hands, this endoscopic T leaf is more superior to the open T leaf. And we saw tonight from Professor Professor Malcolm Bistoni very nice cases of endoscopic fusion and for revision cases. We well, thank you, sir, for this. When we talk about endoscopic spine surgery, so we have different techniques. We have monoportal and biportal, and we have monoportal interlaminar or monoportal transforaminal. We have this in um, lumbar spine, we have this in thoracic spine, and also in cervical spine. We have also biportal technique. We have interlaminar. We have paraspinal, extraforaminal, or transforaminal. And when it comes to fusion, we have also different techniques. We have monoportal endolift over the wire technique. We have UBET lift in different arts and in different techniques with one cage, with big cage, with um, double, double cage. We have also UBA dorsal olive or it will be a T leaf with an X leaf or the olive cage. So monoportal and biportal is a big discussion nowadays. What is the importance of biportal and what brings it to uh, endoscopic spine surgery? And I think when you are rich enough, you would like to have this, these cars before your house. One is very elegant, it's very fast, uh, it's, 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 it's attractive. And the other one is uh, robust, is very strong. You can do with it mini job more than the other one. And, and uh, I, I, I do both technique monoportal and biportal. And biportal technique, I, I do prefer it when I do multiple levels versus stenosis. In the cases of L5, L5S1 intra or extra foraminal pathology, when we need to do the effective debridement 
in V like in, in fixed cases. When, when it comes to endoscopic fusion, then by portal is more strong. We would like to talk about uh, this kick to me. So for disc prolapse pathologies, I, in my opinion, transformal approach is the first choice because we we, uh, we do uh, fast no uh, pony work, but sometimes we have uh, pathology at L five S one with high iliac crest, so interlaminar approach uh, will be my first choice. By L five S one with uh, high iliac crest. That we uh, I would prefer interforaminal uh, or ex, uh, interforaminal or extra inter, uh, extraforaminal approach unilateral biportal. We have also um, when we have lateral or phenomenal disc herniation in cervical spine, so it can be done monoportal or you uh, or unilateral biportal. I would like to take you in a journey and to answer the question why endoscopic spine surgery is a new speciality and when you start to do it now you would be in the future one of the um, one of the gold group who i in my my opinion it's about five to ten percent worldwide spine session now at, who are doing the uh, endoscopic spine surgery uh, but it increases and increases so i advise my colleague to start learning it practicing it doing it we, I will take you on a journey from simple cases to a little bit more complicated cases. I would start with interlaminar discectomy. As we see here, we have a case of uh, disc herniation L5 is one, but we have also an obese patient. So when we do it in endoscopic surgery, it takes us some seconds to a minute to do our approach. But when you do it in another way, it would take more time. So it's my it's a live video. So, incision incision. Is so we do the incision. I do it again. We do the incision. It's like eight millimeter incision. We insert and dilatator. This is a monoportal interlaminar technique. Send another dilatator. Then it comes to the working tube. It's a real time. Then we we will palpate with it where is the lamina or the facet. Then we go with this walking tube. It has you see here we go with this with this direction towards medial, and the other long longer one towards the bone. We rotate we rotate it to enter through the fascia. Uh, at the beginning, you can do lateral X-ray to be sure, especially in obese patient, that you are to the you are deep enough. Then you insert your camera. This is a monoportal interlaminar Elysis Pro. So as you see here, you work. You have through the endoscope, the same endoscope you go inside with your instrument. And then the first thing we see. Over the flower form is a little bit fit tissue. At the beginning, I would clean it. And after cleaning it, so we are now in this obese patient in first two minutes above the flower. Form. This is Anna. By, by radio frequency by bipolar. We clean we clean this uh, wrist muscular uh, wrist fat tissue and muscle over the flavum, the yellow ligament, the flavum ligament we can see now. In this case, we don't need to do complete flavectomy. We don't need to do the compression. We need to do sequestrectomy or then clotomy, discectomy. So this is a this is a very small scissor. What I do now, I'd like to see my scissor. So I I rotate the camera to be perpendicular to my to the instrument. And with the working tube, we do a little bit pressure 
to stretch the flavum ligament. And then, and then we start flavectomy from medial to lateral till we reach the lateral border of the uh, of the neural structure. As we see, we have two layers of flavum, one superficial, the other one is deep. This is the deep one now. This scissor has a sharp end and a not sharp end. With the not sharp end, I use it like the sector to go inside the canal. Now, we, as we see, we are inside the canal. The wasser, the water uh, comes inside the canal, push our neural structure a little bit away. This is epidural fit, it's still deep layer from flavum. Here is cranial, here is caudal. As you see, this is a disc prolapse. The disc prolapse, the disc prolapse, we can see it now. And we are about four to five minutes after the incision. And my message now is for in this obese patient, endoscopic spine surgery gives the most advantage. It's the best option for obese patient through an eight millimeter or a seven millimeter incision, monoportal or biportal. It's another case of a female patient. It's also obese patient, L5S1 without bony work. So it's, this is a flavectomy with a small scissor. This is a spinal canal, epidural fit, the water push the dura away from us, starting doing flavectomy till the bone, till the facet, or till lateral to the neural structures. This small bipolar radio frequency is deflectable and give us a chance also the epidural, uh, small epidural vessels to coagulate it. Here I would I would stop it to see, I don't, when I saw this, I don't know who is this is the dura or the uh, traversing nerve. To be sure that I'm lateral to the traversing nerve, we should reach the bone, we should reach the facet joint. Or we can look if we can if I can see the other end, the other end from the structure, it's like more likely to be the root, not the dura. When we uh, when you expect to have bleeding, it comes most of the time from the lateral side. And here is the uh, Disc That's how it look at the end of the operation. We have the shoulder of the traversing nerve, the traversing nerve free, the axilla is free. We have through less traumatic approach. There is another case of L5S1. This is a post-operative build. So Pre-op, a huge disc. 
supposed to open. Look at the muscle. Please look at the muscle here, multifidus muscle, paraspinal muscle. Look at the working corridor, what we have to do to take out this huge disc. It's really a big advantage from endoscopy. It's also interlaminar technique. It's endoscopic cervical disc to me. Again, in the operation room, it's monoportal. At by an um, a monoportal for a disc herniation, C seven D ions. Field conservative treatment through this small incision. This even the ions. We can do with this endoscopic drill for a monotomy. There's a diamond endoscopic drill from one portal system. This is the SAP, EAP, cranial, podal. And for framinal decompression at cervical spine, we need to coda and the cranial to the nerve to the compressed coda and the cranial to the nerve root. with very small instruments. This is the pedicle, caudal, cranial here. This is a C8 nerve root. C8 nerve root, sorry. It's another advantage to help the patient to avoid fusion. When it comes to the compression, spinal cannulosis and cervical spine, it also can be done through this monoportal eight millimeter incision. We must say all everything you can do with monoportal system, you can also do it with biportal system. And you can see this is nerve root, the cervical melon, ipsilateral. And you can decompress it to see the cervical melon to the contralateral side. Contralateral through the small incision. Two hours after the operation, the patient can walk. I showed some cases for interlaminal approach. What about transforaminal approach? And I said at the beginning, transforaminal approach is my first choice in cases of disc herniation. Is a case of transforaminal approach at L L1, L2. This is a huge, highly migrated disc herniation. This is central dose. This is here disc herniation also. Here is a dorsal part for from this disc herniation. It comes from the foramen, foramen lens till posterior to the uh, dura. We start transforaminal, we enter through the foramen. So we enter through the foramen. We we find the pedicle and SRP. Then we go to take the the first part is the intraforaminal part from disc prolapse. This is the L1 root. So we go through the axilla from L1 root.
it's mere fragment in different area areas located. So some fragments are intraforaminal, some fragments are dorsal posterior to the dura. So the dura is here, this is posterior to the dura. And because of that L because of that L1, L2, a very big foramen cranio and craniocodal orientation. And also it's uh it's not so wide in mediolateral orientation. It comes that I prepared myself when it doesn't come outside easily. So I would take, I would go interlaminar. I do a little bit flavic to me or the, from lateral recess and from the tip from SRP. Superior article process to go to the canal. So we go to the house now from the fin from the window, from the forearm. This is a disc fragment which posterior to the dura. We we can see now the dura start to pulsate. And it's the other side. So I find transformer approach is a very elegant, the, one of the most minimal invasive approaches. But when it comes to intraforaminal or, the, or extraforaminal pathologies in L5 is one with high iliac crest. So I prefer it in unilateral biportal. Like we saw with Professor Markham in his talk, the L, the exiting nerve runs about two centimeter. The exiting nerve runs medial to the cranial pedicle and then lateral to the caudal pedicle when the when we like to decompress it or uh, we fry it. So we'd like to check the pathway of the exiting nerve, medial to the cranial lateral to the caudal pedicle. Here is a, a video of a case of extra foraminal, uh, interforaminal, extra foraminal stenosis in an obese patient. Here is caudal. We started from the from the ala. Here the it gets inside inside uh, towards ventrally. Here is the transverse process. Here is the foramen. This is the disc, disc space, L5 root. It's another case, cranial, caudal, facet SRP. Disc here, this is a cranial pedicle, L5 pedicle. L5 root comes outside. This is a disc space, L5 S1. And it go, it goes in towards ventral. And I have a little question: Which approach would you prefer in in this case? This is a thirty eight year old patient with a huge highly upmigrated disc herniation. So we can, we have interlaminal approach, transforaminal approach, and uh, monoportal, and we have UBA, unilateral biportal, can also done interlaminal and, and extra um, uh, interlaminal or paraspinal. I, I did it in unilateral bipartal. I did it in here's a disc herniation. It comes from 
towards Ohm, L45 to L34. I prefer to do it in a uh, unilateral pi portal. This is a cranial. Here is codal. Ipsilateral side from to the contralateral side. The pathology in the contralateral side is a codal lamina. And we can see here what is the difference between unilateral and monoportal and pi portal. We see with pi portal, we have more flexibility with our instruments. We can use more instruments. We can use more big and more flexible instruments. So I, I prefer to come from the contralateral side and to preserve the ipsilateral deep flavum layer, not to take a lot from the facetrons or from the ipsilateral lamina, who I would like to go more to, towards cranial. This is the first fragment. This is a big one. And as you see, I do undercutting from the base of spinous process towards the contralateral side, towards cranial. This is the, the dura, contralateral facet joints, disc space contralateral side. Axilla of the exiting nerve contralateral side. And this is, gives the advantage, as I said, that we don't we don't do a lot of bone loss or uh, do any iatrogenic instability. And at the same time, when we think we can do it transforaminal, and I did a lot of cases, highly migrated cases, transforaminal, we must think when we don't get it of one time, when we don't get it uh one as one, one big fragment and still another fragment highly up migrated so to go with monoportal transforaminal towards highly up migrated sometimes we cannot avoid the uh, not to irritate the ganglion the root ganglion in the forum so it's more safe in this technique in my opinion this is another case with another advantage from this kick to me under uh, in unilateral biportal techniques. It's, and we have the master of doing it also under local anesthesia, Professor Malcolm. This is a unilateral biportal from the operation room. The patient is on, only under local anesthesia and uh, analgetic. And I would ask his uh, axil, as is uh, uh, um, traversing the fruit. I ask the patient to move his leg, uh, his leg during the operation. So it's also an advantage, a big advantage. So we can do operation for patients who can not uh, or are not suitable for anesthesia. And this is about this kick to me. And I said, as I said, endoscopy saves a lot of patient. When we need to do this kick to me, that we don't, we don't do a lot of bony work and to avoid fusion. And when it comes to the compression, we have multiple techniques. We have transforaminal technique for non-foraminal stenosis, or lateral stenosis, that's a monoportal. We have elysis delta, a big uh, interlaminar uh, scope. Uh, we have also unilateral biportal, and in I we would prefer unilateral biportal for most of cases of the compression. This is a case of uh, a gentleman with severe stenosis at, at L4 fourth and L3-4. Uh, he had only colodicatio, and he cannot walk more than uh, more than. Um, back pain, and in this case, I I, sh I would show you pre-op. This is how was it, post-op, 
interop so with pipe with ube in lateral pipe portal you can reach the forum in, in the contralateral side here is a flavictomy that's a big a butterfly or how it call it in block flavictomy and this is at the end of the operation at one level this is a caudal here is caudal ipsilateral caudal ipsilateral is traversing root ipsilateral disc space ipsilateral so ipsilateral uh, lateral is ipsilateral is free so we go over the top really easily and fast this cranial undercutting the uh, the lamina towards cranially this is the facet joints in contralateral we go caudally to the caudal pedicle contralateral and here is the axilla of the traversing root in the contralateral side I do an I, do, I have done MRI for educational purposes. And as we see, this is post-operative MRI. And I would like to ask you to look at the muscles. Two days after the, or the third day after the operation. How, how is it with uh, smiley or happy dura, we can call it. This is another case with two level stenosis done with unilateral biportal. It shows us how is the unilateral biportal technique very powerful in the compression. And also it's really minimal invasive. It saves the muscle and less traumatic. It's an obese patient. This level of uh, five uh, is three, four. Pre-op, post-op, facet joints, muscles, second level, four five, pre-op, post-op, set level, five is one, pre-op, post-op, I would not take a lot of time to talk about the steps of unilateral by portal. We can make another talk about it, but it was, it's nice to, to know that endoscopic spine surgery can do this kick to me, can do the compression. And when it comes to fusion, so it plays a very important role. And the question is what we need by fusion. What is the challenge of all kinds of fusion? To have a solid fusion, to do the compression, to do it in a minimal invasive way to protect the posterior structures, including paraspinal muscles. So solid fusion, this is a disc space from inside after disc place preparation in the, within the scope. When you do it or in open way, when I do it in an open way, I cannot see and sure that in the disc space is so clean like this. What we need is to remove the cartilage in the bone, but to keep the bony in the plate like this. And this is the first rule to get fusion. With endoscope, we can have different techniques. We can do the, uh, we can uh, put the cage anterior to get more lower doses. We can put it a little bit more posterior to get more indirect decompression for the, for the other foramen. We can put a big cage, we can put an x lift cage. There's more different techniques in the scope enable us to do this. Also with an x lift cage, it's like, 8, 18 millimeter, 45 millimeters, a huge cage. It's, it's, it's a cage what we need. This it's it's actually this cage is for for X lift or an olive. 
So this is a case I did from posterior. So and we like T leaf or posterior olive. It's a very big cage. This was a patient with a cyst. It needs a direct compression. I had a little bit rotatory uh, rotation instability here. Had uh, facet cyst. And he means a facet, severe back pain, uh, leg pain. We decide, I decided to do fusion for her. But when you when you do it from anterior with a big cage, you must go back. You can you must go back to do direct compression. So in this copy, in this patient have an advantage to do the whole job from posterior. So in the scope of fusion, we have to, as I said, two ways, an over the wire technique, monoportal technique. For this monoportal or over the wire technique, we must uh, select our patient. The best patient for this, and when you start, is you select your first space, it's better to start with level L23 or L34 because in this level you have a white foramen in craniocaudal orientation, but not a white facet in mediolateral orientation. You you come you come from lateral. So trans in through the campaign triangle, we start with putting a wire or this is a campaign triangle. Caudal, caudal is a caudal pedicle, traversing route, exiting route. So we start with our needle here. We go in the disc space and the medial border of the pedicle. And then we, we must we must think that this this is a can be trying this is a pedicle the root nerve root come like this and the facet make it very small we can go through this small place with our trans uh, transforaminal working tube but with to go with a big cage or that was 12 millimeter cage we must take this away we must take a little bit from the uh, not, not only a little bit we must take from SRP superarticular process to have a place to widen the cambium triangle, to widen the foramen to reach the cambium triangle. Then we enter the disc space, there are different trimmers to do this, and then we can put the cage over the wire. The same way can be done in unilateral by portal techniques. So when we come for extra foraminal and we take a little bit from, we take from SRP to expand the cambium triangle. This is with permission from Dr. My colleagues, Dr. Poli. This is a case for monoportal transforaminal or transcampine fusion. A gentleman with uh, spondylodiscites L23, multimorbid multimorbid male patient. This is the intraoperative in the plate in discitis with spondylodiscites. Intraoperative X-ray postoperative. This is 14 millimeter wound for cage insertion, percutaneous screw. Thin months control, and we see fusion, a good fusion, and the patient is is doing very nice, very happy. The other case of multi-morbid patient, obese, dialysis dependent, I decided to do the most minimal invasive technique, in my opinion, as we are, as this is. Transforaminal, endolift technique over the wire, as is supposed to op, five months post to op, she is doing well. And now the other techniques is UBE T lift, unilateral biporta T lift. So this is from the operation room. Under the vision, 
of Inscope. After doing facetectomy, we insert the cage. This is the cage inside. And I then I start to do flabectomy and do more, more decompression. Busto, this is post-operative uh, CT, we show the location of the cage. In, also in cases in on um, lytic spondylolisthesis, UBET lift help us to the shop. This is a cage in place. The existing nerve is caudally. It's another case of spindle, uh, of lytic spondylolisthesis L5 is one done with unilateral biportal. This is the incisions. A supposed to operative CT three months after the operation. I had this patient I have done more than one and a half year now. She is doing very well. This is the end plate before incision of the cage. Cage inside the disk space. So also with, with double cage, so we cannot only one, put one cage when we have, would like to have more footprint, we can put double cage, is a, a case with a double cage. This is the ex exiting nerve root. This is the first cage. Still flavum. I come from outside. This is a real T lift technique from lateral. Rotate the cage and put it more anterior. Put some calcium phosphate, some bone, institute, bone products, and then I will put my more smaller cage up. This is a second cage insertion. It must be a little bit faster. And this is like Professor Markham said, this is extra flavum technique. We come from outside, we do the real T lift endoscope. And here I start to do more to compression and support a lamina. It's a pedicle called a lamina. And I'd like to show you how you can do crossover or the over the top the compression. So you do the compression, you put two kids, we do fusion. That's it. There's a contralateral facet joints. In some cases, we need to do when I need to do bi bi uh, bilateral facetectomy before I put the cage to have more release. We can do it. So two kids inside. Then you have existing nerve. You see it. Dura ips. From epsilateral to the contralateral side. It's another cage with double cage, an L5S1. And look how is big is the footprint. When we need, so I'd like to say, when we need to have a big footprint for more stability, for bigger chance for fusion, so we can put 
two kids or put a big kid. This is from the this small incision. I put the two kids through the same incision for percutaneous screw. It's another case for lytic spondylolisthesis with double cage. This is a post-operative uh, CT. And when it comes to cases with pony distractions from spondylodiscites and I need to put a big cage, so I still can do it. So the most of these patients with infections, they come with epidural abscess, uh, pony distraction. Sometimes you need to do it from posterior and anterior. This is then this is one operation. It's done with an X lift, a big X lift cage in a unilateral biportal technique. The cage is from the pedicle to the pedicle. You can see it pre and post op here. And here we see the corridor. I do fasciectomy, laminectomy, epsilateral. I get enough space. I retract the traversing nerve, the exiting nerve. I have uh, I have enough space to get this 18 millimeter cage inside the disc space and to rotate it. So I don't have any cons I didn't have any consideration that doesn't in such a case of infection with uh, pony destruction uh, with cave subsidence. Also, when it comes to vision cases, you can, the endoscopy can help us with this. So my message today is endoscopic spine surgery is a new specialty. If you would like to hear this or not, it's a new specialty. Endoscopic spine surgery can do many tasks in spine surgery, effective surgery, and in a very minimal invasive or the ultra minimal invasive way. It can help patients who could not tolerate the general anesthesia to do some procedures on the local anesthesia. It can help patients with simple discontinuation in my age and in younger aids or they don't like to have operation to get a very small ultra minimal invasive way to get this disc prolapse or herniation away and, and to save the paraspinal muscles and to save the, uh, the stability for the future when you think you you do good for the, your patient when you fuse him for a disc a big a huge disc prolapse it's not the best what we are doing for a young patient who we need to, to, to have him at the workplace after some weeks from the operation. So with endoscopic spine surgery, you have the patients with disc prolapse after some weeks. They are, after some hours of the operation, they are very happy and they can walk. But after some weeks, they go back to work and they feel uh, better and they go back to work. So this to fuse, it's not the best option in this case to me when you don't need to fuse. When we fuse because of iatrogenic instability, so we must think about it. But when it comes to the compression, it's also it's, it's not the, the best option for the patient who has no instability symptoms or no really in problem with instability to do the compression. And we as surgeons, do the iatrogenic instability, so we must fuse him. Or when we come to fuse as a patient, we need fusion. So we don't must have to open the spinal muscles and to destroy the paraspinal muscles sometimes to get one level fusion, and then we have no function in the paraspinal muscles. So I, I in my message today, who is interested in spine surgery, you are in the right way. Who is doing a spine surgery, endoscopic spine surgery, you are really in the right way. You sh we should invest our time, our effort, it deserves. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ayat, for this uh, very interesting presentation. 
Thank you so much, uh, Professor Malcolm. Professor Malcolm is saluting you for uh, this uh, uh, nice presentation, sir. Thank you, Professor Malcolm. You are a big master, sir. Like that, yes. Professor Malcolm, if we have any comments, sir, please. No, great work. And he's put everything in a nutshell. He's really covered the whole spectrum very beautifully. As a matter of fact, as I mentioned before, I've been watching his work and he's amazing. Thank great you so much. Work. Great work, Dr. Yes, uh, please, sir. I, I will put this presentation on the uh, YouTube channel of the uh, Egyptian Orthopedic Association if you accept that. Yes, please. You're most welcome. I think, sir, it will be a reference for any uh, spinal surgeon that wants to begin his career in endoscopic spinal surgery. I think these presentations and this day will be a, a, a very good start for him, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, if we have any questions to uh, Dr. Raid, please. I, I think your presentation, Dr. Raid, was uh, uh, so simple that uh, I, I think we uh, everything you make everything obvious to us. Thanks so much, it, Professor Mohammed. I'd you like to, from my heart thank Professor Pistoni to be with us till now because uh, because it's, uh, it's it's late in India. Yeah. Late in India, maybe sure. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir. It was I, an honor. I, I see a question from uh, the colleagues now. Somebody is sure. Most welcome. Ashraf is there, I think. No, I think he was. Uh, Ashraf was raising his hand uh, uh, in the uh, previous one. In the uh, presentation of Professor Malcolm. No, no. Thank you so much. I think we have no questions. Uh, yes, uh, Doctor Anas asked to. Dr. Anas, you. Is he there online? Yes, you can unmute, Dr. Anas. Unmute yourself. You are muted, Dr. Anas. If you want to have a question, unmute yourself. No, I, I, I think we have no more questions. Uh, finally, I would like to thank Professor Malcolm Pistonge from India for uh, being with us to this uh, late uh, time of uh, at the end of the night. Thank you so much, sir. Also, my dear friend, Dr. Raed Abhassin from Germany for being with us and for sharing your experiences uh, with us, your long experience, Professor Malcolm and, and Dr. Raed. Thank you so much, sir. I think this will be the start for any orthopedic surgeon who wants to practice endoscopic spinal surgery. Thank you so much, sir. Have a very good night. Thank you so much, sir. Thank Have you. Good Thank, night. You, Thank, you. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.